Hello, today we have the paper Learning Graph Search Heuristics by Michael Pandi and you can find the information to join these reading group sessions yourselves in the link in the description. As, as Hannes said, I'm Michael, I'm the, the first author in this work, uh, which, which is about Learning Graph Search Heuristics. I, I just finished my master's at Cambridge University, uh, where I worked with Professor Pietro Leo. Uh, and yeah, so I, I did an internship now in Google Research. I, actually very recently finished. We worked on something related to computer vision and uh, transfer learning. And basically now I'm in this position where I have some free time. And also that's why I have time to talk to you today and uh, kind of explain some of my work that I did uh, in the past year. And hopefully you'll enjoy it. Uh, and this was also presented recently in Europe's and the physical reasoning and interactive biases for the real world workshop. So if you were there, then I'm sorry, this is really like the same stuff. Uh, so, but feel free to stay if you have any questions, etc. So yeah, so this this work is about learning graph search heuristics with my co-authors Rex, Gabriela, Petar, Jura, and Pietro from a bunch of institutions, which are too long to name. But Rex is now at Yale, Gabriela is in MIT, Petar is in DeepMind, Jura is in Stanford, and Pietro is in Cambridge. So yeah, every, people from all around came together to work on this. And uh, yeah, so hopefully you'll enjoy this talk or I mean this this reading group. I really want to keep this as a discussion. So at any point, if you have some question, you know, feel free to ask. I'm more than happy to answer, or especially if you have some critique, because that would be the the, the most fruitful, I guess. So um, I I think we can get going. Uh, okay. So basically, first I want to discuss some motivation uh, why we looked into this, why this is a, maybe an interesting area of research. I'm pretty sure you're, most of you are aware of more or less how graph search works or like what these heuristics are when you're doing search, but we'll also touch on that. And then we will go through some of the approach and the experiment. So there's quite a bit of a component which is not necessarily related to GNNs. So maybe you will learn something and maybe then when we talk about GNNs, maybe you will teach, teach me something because I'm not, not necessarily a GNN expert. So I also have you to learn here. So basically, uh, the first kind of place where, you know, heuristics arise very naturally are in robotics. So basically there's this very nice paper by Bart et al. from Coral in 2000, uh, roughly 19, where they show that actually if you have like two different use cases in robotics, quite often people would employ vastly different planning algorithms. So for example, on the left hand side, you have a use case where there's basically nothing in the environment. Sometimes you might have a tower or a tree. And actually what works very well in this situation is uh, some kind of local trajectory optimization. So just some kind of simple planner that you know, sometimes uh, like uses some kind of gradient-based optimization to optimize the trajectory extremely quickly because you have almost no obstacles. And then on the right-hand side, you might have a little bit more kind of structured environment where you have a lot of mountains. And there, what tends to work well is that you have to spend a little bit more time computing. And basically what ends up happening is that like something like RRT star or RRT, if you're familiar, would work pretty well. But of course it takes more and more sampling to, to compute these plans. And so this is the first kind of interesting use case where you see that like you have two different kind of, um, like two different scenes. And for these two different scenes, you have like vastly different planning algorithms or planning approaches that work well. And so it would be extremely nice if you would not have to like ask an expert, like, hey, I have this scene, like what should I do? But you could just, you know, take some kind of structure from this environment and learn some parameters from it that you can then use in your planner or use, use to adjust your algorithm. Um, so that's kind of the first motivation. And then I was like looking around because I was aware of this problem and I was looking around a little bit more like if there's something more general that we can look at. And actually, and I found this kind of very nice example uh, in urban kind of search when you have uh, these kind of very interesting city network. So on the left hand side, you can see the, the road network of LA, which in this kind of, it's like an OS, I don't know, maybe you're aware, it's like an OSMNX, I think it's called, or, or something along those lines. It has roughly like 80,000 nodes and you want to somehow search in this network. But you can imagine that this network can be much bigger if you, let's say, are building an app that has to do planning or search 
in something like the, the you know the the grid or or the, the the network of USA. Like there, you're talking about like millions and millions of nodes, and that's why also people ask this question a bunch of time on Stack Overflow. Like, hey, I'm you know I'm implementing I'm implementing my my app, my map, you know, and I need to do some search. I need you know my cars to plan their routes from New York to LA. Although it's probably unlikely, or maybe like from New York to Boston, and it takes too long. And so, and you you get this like most upward answer, which is by someone who said that you know they spent 18 months working in some kind of mapping company where where he learned like a bunch of heuristics that you know work very well in practice. And so, like the, the idea is that like like it's it's nice, but but ideally you shouldn't work or you shouldn't need to ask someone who like or find some experts that did some like crazy work on these kind of applications. But maybe you should just like take these graphs and look at their structure. And then you know learn some parameters from that that you can use to you know, devise these heuristics if that makes sense. So these are like two applications that I, I like, but there are of course more. Um, so for example, I have a bunch on the left hand side here. So we find something in chemistry where you have like synthesis synthesis, synthesis planning, and then of course in robotics, and you know and, and a lot more. So there's places where kind of the problem that you run into is that you want to search some kind of like solution, some kind of path in a graph, and you want to minimize the number of nodes that you visit in this pathfinding process. And your solutions shouldn't be too bad, but you, at the end of the day, you care about like finding a path rather than finding, let's say the shortest path or the most optimal path, depending on how you define the cost in, in, in your specific use case. So we found a bunch of examples in these in these areas. Again, I think robotics is the most important one, but there were there were a couple more. Um, for I mean, like in let's say urban planning, you might not care necessarily uh, if if the path is like two minutes longer, or the, uh, arguably you would care. But like if if your users have a very bad user experience, and you know it, it takes you know you know five minutes to find the path, maybe they won't ever ever use the app. So I think this, these are kind of the the, tr the, the, the trade-offs that you're looking at here. And so the, the, the problem can be stated like on a high level, as you can see on the right-hand side. So you have some kind of distribution of problems, distribution of graphs and nodes in these graphs. And what you want to do at the end of the day is to get some kind of parameters from, these, from, from this distribution of graphs. And this, these parameters, you then want to use in some kind of search algorithm. And in, in our specific case, the, the 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 parameters that we get out are parameters that parameterize the the heuristic function, and then we use it in something like greedy best first search. So this is the the high level story, and um, from now on it will be more more into detail. Oh yeah, so Hans. Yeah. Can we, can we maybe uh, before we finish the high level story go to your um, to your example where you have these these mazes that you're solving. Yeah, the blue lines appearing. Yeah, yeah. So that that will come up more, but I think here, yeah, you have yeah. these two. because to me that's just the, the best example to to understand it, right? So what you're saying is, um, in principle, like if we don't know anything about the underlying problem, right, we can't have some smart alg algorithm that does anything faster than just a breath first search, right? Yes. So, so the, the idea is that like the first first layer of information you would have, let's say, are the, the coordinates of the nodes. And then already you can do something like, you know, for you, your kind of algorithm could be like the A star that you learned about, you know, in, in, in university. But what I'm saying is a little bit stronger. What I'm saying is that if you have a bunch of examples that are somehow structurally similar, then you can go the extra step and learn something more than just taking, let's say, the L2 distance in, in the nodes. Yeah. yeah. And here now, for example, a heuristic would be um, like the, the, the domain expert that who knows these mazes very well. He knows, yeah, it is nice if I, I always go to the top right. Uh, but if I hit a wall, I go along that wall. And but then I try to go uh, to the top right again. And whenever I hit a corner, then I go along that corner and then I go to uh, the bottom right when I leave the second corner. And this could be some heuristic. And maybe this heuristic works very well for this, this special type of maze or this yeah. special type of maze problem. But now we want to, yeah, we don't want an expert who has to know 
this type of problem, but instead we just throw your method at this type of problem and show it a bunch of these, uh, a bunch of examples of this problem, and we will find a nice heuristic. That's exactly the idea, and and like the the strength of the heuristic will be the depending will depend on the kind of the graph that you you or the set of graphs that you provide. Yeah. Like if, if it's only one graph, then you know, of course the strongest thing is to learn the distances of all the nodes to the to the goal. But the more examples you have, like then the weaker is the heuristic, but it you know at the end of the day it will be the strongest you might possibly have from the set of examples that you have. Yeah, I think we have another question. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. So I may be jumping the gun a little bit, but I was wondering, with respect to the heuristics that you actually extract from the graphs and the examples, are they, are they do they eventually just become like interpretable in any way? Or so that I think, well, you can always. So, so I think a nice visual. So you can always look at the the you know what happens when when they. Uh, let's say in, in this case, you can see that, or if you run it on a few examples, you can see like roughly what it does. That it, it is like going along the wall, and then once the wall ends, you know, it 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 goes the other way. I think that it when we go to some other examples in let's say cities, then we I think I think what we saw is that it made sense to go through the center of the city, but we didn't like really think about methods to like interpret it, like let's say a little bit more interestingly or in a better way, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. The only reason I bring this up is because it's very like heuristics. Like the nature of heuristics require some level of interpretability of what they actually mean, or at least to develop them in a way that's like knowledgeable, right? And then if we're able to find methods to interpret these um, learned heuristics, then we can find methods to uh, use those ideas to inform new uh, heuristics that we could engineer potentially. Yeah, yeah, that's a nice idea. Yeah, um, yeah, it would be it would be cool. Future work. Yeah. So, but but yeah. Yeah, I think we have another question. Hello, Mehal. I just had a quick question. How is this yeah. similar or different to just plain reinforcement learning? Or is there any similarities? Yeah, so, so well, so, so I think that the question here is like, of course, you can set up the MVP in a way where you would like solve the same problem. But what we saw is that like in the math, in kind of our method, we saw that like if you like go that route where you like phrase this as an MVP and then use some kind of reinforcement learning, it doesn't work very well. But but may like you know, it, it is not necessarily different in a way where you can phrase this as an MVP and then solve the MVP. And this this is more or less what we do, but it is more about, you know, it's not necessarily different, it's just like, you know, just introducing it from maybe a different perspective. Okay, okay. Thank you. Okay, cool. Um, so if everything is clear, I think we can move on to, well, this is just like, a, you know, just talking about like what a heuristic is, but I, I'm sure most of you know, uh, but, it, you know, in this case, what we what we looked at is that like these kind of heuristics actually can guide your search by trying to predict the distances or the, the costs of each node or so. So that that's more or less the idea. So in, in general, like if you implement your search algorithm, you have some graph and you have like a candidate queue of, of nodes and you generally pop a node. I think in this slide, the concepts that are important are like the colors. So it, because we use them in the next slide. So we have unseen nodes, which are gray. Then we have fringe nodes, which are nodes that we haven't explored yet, but we can explore them in the next step. And by explore, I mean, like move them into the visited set of nodes. And then the blue nodes are the nodes that we already visited. And so again, like what, what we tried is we, we said, okay, let's have these parameters be the heuristic in our, in our kind of greedy best first search algorithm. So I hope that's clear. So yeah, so here we come to the goal or like try to like uh, create the research question is that we want to somehow train a model to predict these shortest paths between nodes. Because once you have a model that predicts shortest paths, you have solved this kind of heuristic problem that you're, you're looking to solve. And then we want to use it within an algorithm to find these kind of feasible paths and as little node expansions as possible. And so you might think like, wow, this is you know, very trivial. Like, why don't we just you know, sample pairs of nodes and predict their distances? Like, you know, <laughs> just, just like how you would naively think of doing that. But actually, like the first challenge that we found is that in this case, as you can imagine, the, the data distribution is not IID. 
And that is because like when you're running your algorithm, you predict like the distance of a node and this prediction then that kind of determines what you observe next. So like the data distribution is not IID and you cannot necessarily just like, you know, launch your favorite like supervised learning algorithm on this because it will probably fail. And that's what we already, well, that's what we also saw. So part of this talk is about like how do you how do you go about this and so it was actually up to 40 times worse in terms of number of visited nodes during search where you just like naively try to predict their distances and so then the next challenges which are maybe a little bit hidden is that actually like you want your heuristic to be fast or ideally fast because you know when you it could be the case that when you put a lot of you spend a lot of time computing the heuristic like even though you're computing your paths very well actually the whole, whole algorithm is running extremely slow and so like in terms of complexity like the, the heuristic should be ideally constant with respect to the, the dimensions of the graph and then the, finally the, the last part that we found is that it is actually also what one of the comments was actually like just like like throwing RL at this problem is not necessarily the best idea or like some 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 like fairly recent RL methods won't necessarily like solve this problem. Um, so that's clear we can move on. And so now we are kind of moving on to the approach section. Um, and so here this will be a little bit more high level. In the paper there were more details, but like we can also jump to the paper if, if, if someone has questions about the details. Um, so yeah, so the, the name of the method is fill, which is like path heuristic with imitation learning. And so roughly the, this is the idea of the imitation learning algorithm. So the, the, the high level idea of the imitation learning algorithm is that we want to create an algorithm that imitates the optimal kind of algorithm. And the optimal algorithm in our case is an algorithm which has access to the optimal heuristic, which is a heuristic that correctly determines the distances between nodes. And so this is kind of why it's an imitation learning algorithm. And it's also because we are kind of sampling an MDP, but that's that's for, for, for another time. But so basically in the first step, what we do is we sample a search problem, which is like specified by a graph and two nodes uh, from some kind of underlying distribution. And in our case, this just means that we have a data set of graphs and nodes. And then in the next step, what we do is we roll in the learn algorithm for T steps. And so I want to dwell on some of the, the, the words here because they might be not so clear. So firstly, like T is, is a random variable with just like a discrete uniform uh, distribution between zero and T steps and large T is a, is a hyperparameter. And roll in simply means that we execute the learned algorithm. And so that means that we like, you know, for T steps, we predict the distances of the fringe nodes then we kind of uh, put them in a queue, pick the shortest one, then add it to the visited set and obtain a new set of fringe nodes. And we, we repeat this for T steps. And so this is called the roll-in. Uh, it's called it's kind of from, from an imitation learning literature because we are not doing any learning in this step. We are simply kind of just executing our, an algorithm to get into some kind of state. And then, oh, sorry, Hannah, sorry, I didn't notice your question. Yeah, so if we... Never mind. I think that's coming up. Okay, but we have another question. So let's hear it. Yeah, hi. Uh, I had a quick question. So you said that you have access to this optimal heuristic. So in this case, do you have like a deterministic algorithm like Dijkstra or something, which gives you the exact answer to the search path, and then you try to imitate that? Yeah. All right, so uh, I just have a follow-up question. So I kind of browsed through your paper, but this is like, maybe you could answer it better later, but just a quick question. So have you tried anything like uh, GAN-based uh, imitation learning in which you would possibly generate fake trajectories and then the expert would try to, you know, would act like a discriminator and correct the trajectory sequentially? So what, what would be the GAN idea? So what are you trying to predict trajectories? Uh, and so the, like it, it would just randomly generate the trajectories like a generator does. And the discriminator would be something like the optimal trajectories that you find from the expert algorithm and which would try to, you know, kind of like counteract the generated examples and remove this, uh, you'd reach an equilibrium in like GAN based imitation learning. I was just trying to like kind of compare, maybe it's not the best idea at the moment. So I know I haven't tried it, but you know, give it a shot. Maybe it will work. I All right. So I'm, I'm, okay, go ahead. It's just like a, yeah. maybe. Okay. Or, uh, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks. I think we have another question. Yes. Uh, yes, Mihal. For the roll-in, uh, what would be your starting point? You would start with the scene node, 
When yeah, so, so the, the starting point is always the same. You have the, the starting node in the scene set or the visited set, and then okay. the rest is in the fringe. What, what I mean, the fringe is, is defined by the graph, and then you have the unseen set. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And so, I mean, the, the motivation of this role in is that you want to, during your training, you want to explore a lot of kind of states of, of like in this kind of graph or you know, the MDP. You want to you kind know, of explore everything. You can't necessarily just always learn from the first step because then the problem becomes that if your graph is extremely large, then you can't actually, because, okay, so we will learn kind of these sequences. So we will do some backpropagation through time. And it becomes extremely hard to backpropagate through time through thousands and thousands and thousands of steps. So this is like a remedy because you roll in for a certain number of steps and then you roll out, but you know, we'll talk about that in a second, but you roll out for a fixed number of steps. So you get to see a lot of, lot of new states. You still get, get this kind of sequential representation learning where you're trying to learn the representation of what you see, what you saw so far, but you don't, you cannot really backpropagate through, you know, a, like a lot of like thousands of steps, but that might not be true. I, I'm not sure anyone. But, yeah. um, so okay, so in the rollout phase, the rollout is different from the rolling in that like in this phase you're collecting data where we, that you want to like use for learning. So in this step we roll out the mixture algorithm. I'll explain it in a second for uh, kind of t tau steps. This is like a hyperparameter, and we aggregate this data set of sequences of sets of new fringe nodes and kind of their distances to the goal mode. And I'll, and I'll explain it in a second, but first I want to talk about the mixture algorithm. Something that's nice about this setup and like in general, when you have cost to go imitation learning is that you have access to the, the optimal kind of policy or the optimal algorithm at, at train time. So, so the way to make use of this is quite like, you, like what you can do is that you can use this kind of mixture, mixture algorithm idea where instead of just like executing your, your, your learned algorithm, especially in the beginning of training, you like aggressively uh, execute the optimal algorithm. So you're popping from an optimal queue. So that, that would mean like knowing the, the ground truth distances to the target and then popping from that and executing those steps. And so, and, and sometimes also executing your, your own algorithm. And so you do this every step kind of probabilistically blending the two. The, the idea is that you have some kind of probability with which you use kind of the optimal algorithm and then you kind of flip a coin at each step and you either use the optimal algorithm or you use kind of your own learned algorithm. And so you're have, you maintain these two cues that you're popping from and you decay this probability over time. So toward the end of training, you're, you're using your learned algorithm for, for also the rollouts, if that makes sense. And what's the, the issue with only using our bad algorithm, so to say, like our bad, our non-optimal heuristic for exploring? I think I think the idea, or at least what what we what what I found is that it learns faster. If that makes sense. Okay, and what if we were to only use the, the optimal heuristic for exploring? I'm pretty sure it would work. It would work like okay. Okay. But, but there is some paper that you, there was like um, I think it's called Lowe's, and they had like a very interesting like um, like chart. Where where they they this is what they actually looked at, and like I'm I to be honest I just took that paper and I saw that this is the best thing to do and I did that, but I think that they they did some kind of analysis a little bit more also theoretically where they found that like depending on what kind of decisions you make here like you know obviously there are like more ways to do this like rolling could be mixture or rolling could be just algorithm like they found that this is the like the approach that works best. Uh, and I, you know, I wish I, I knew a lot more about that, but like currently I, I don't really remember like what were the exact arguments, but it was pretty like theoretically grounded. Okay. Yeah. Like I was just imagining if we were to only use the, the optimal policy all the time for exploring, then it would be a sort of like, if we don't, uh, then during test time, if we don't have the optimal policy and we ever get off track, so to say, into a into a bad direction then yeah we get even more off track and into an even more even worse direction well yeah i mean if you only use the optimal then that's that's the case you cannot only use the optimal okay if you only use the optimal then kind of the data distribution it will be always the same like you want to have that noise that comes from the, the your own algorithm especially in the beginning of training um 
but the problem yeah so that that's the idea or what especially in the beginning of training i thought uh, it was the other way around in the beginning of training, we want to use the optimal policy more. And towards the end of it, when we already have a halfway okay policy, yeah. then we want to stop using the, the optimal policy and yeah, choose choose our policy with a higher probability. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, thanks for clarifying. Yeah. Mm, okay. And so, so you, you can just just to kind of visualize like what what that does. You have like a so kind of in each kind of in this sequence, you have a set of new fringe nodes when you expand one node. So in this case, the set of new fringe nodes is in like the yellow nodes here are in B one. So this is the new set of fringe nodes, and you would like have the sequence, and you also store H one. That is kind of the these are the distances to the target. And in the next step, you have. Uh, like you know the next node uh, because you kind of you do the rollout and you have like another nodes and in b2 and then let's say you know b3 is the last one but this is just kind of showing the expansion process and like i, I try to underline that these are sets of nodes not necessarily just like individual nodes and that's that's important for the next bit um yeah no next bit yet uh can you quickly explain again um what we mean with optimal policy here or how do you come up with your optimal policy for a graph uh, for your training data yeah so the optimal policy is an algorithm that knows exactly the distances to the target so that would be you kind of run the extra and you know the distances to the target and so that means that in each step you know the correct distances of the fringe and so when you execute doctrinal policy in one step, that means moving the node from the fringe that is the, the closest as determined by the optimal policy, by the policy that knows the distances. So kind of if we're if we're starting here, for example, yeah. then yeah, you just have your um, or you go ahead and take everything as the first node and do a breath first search from it until you end up at VG and you take that as your distance, like the, the hop distance. Yeah, so, so in practice, what you do, you pre-compute the, the distances um, yeah. before training and you know, you know right away, like the distance of that is three, right? So, I mean, sorry, the optimal would be, I don't know, in this case, I guess there's like a tie, but it, you see like you pre-compute that, so you don't necessarily run it every time. Yes, but like during, during training, of course, we can do that for our, our training data, but then during test time, that's when we, yeah, when we don't want to. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so this is, this, what we're talking about here is purely training. This test time, you're purely using your own kind of uh, heuristic. You're not doing any of this like probabilistic blending. Basically test time is fully the roll-in phase. It is roll-in phase until you get to the goal node. Okay, then, sorry, I won't try to pronounce your name. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I had a very quick one. Uh, are you expanding on the fringe nodes, uh, do you decide which node to expand based on the uh, shortest distance that it has traveled so far? How do you choose which fringe nodes to expand? Yeah, so, so that, that's where you use the, 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 the predictions of the, 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 kind of the heuristic function that you're learning. So you either, is, sorry, go ahead. So you're, you either use that or you either use the, the ground truth distances, which we kind of just discussed, which are these kind of like optimal policy ground truth distances. But you also use the, the predictions of your algorithm. Understood. Quick yeah. question. Can you expand multiple fringe nodes in parallel can you do multi-processing in some way uh yeah so so maybe if you can explain why that would be useful then for massive yeah. graphs that's scaled to terabytes scale uh single threaded program would rather be quite slow so I, i'm not sure if the expansion is the maybe it is like i'm i so I, I don't think that we try to solve this like you know i think this is more like a systems problem where like of course you could take the k 
like whatever we predict are the k closest one and expand all of those at the same time but this is not necessarily like we weren't concerned with what is like the best way to have the k best expansions rather than just one yeah understood understood got it thank you no worries. okay cool uh and so the fourth step is oh sorry Okay, so the fourth step is you like train this heuristic function on B and you basically use backpropagation through time on these sequences that you collect or you aggregate during training. And then you go back to step one and you repeat this process until you have something that converged or that you're happy with. Um, so that's the high level idea. I think I have a visualization here. Like again, this is just like the this diff different way to show what's happening, like S here are the states of the search, Z is some kind of representation that you have, like this is kind of the deprivation through time idea that we will explore in a second. And so a pi theta is like your learned algorithm and pi mix is the mixture algorithm. And that's exactly what we do, like we roll in for T steps and then we roll out and we, 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 we optimize on, on the rolled out trajectory. Yeah. So if that's clear, that's awesome. Uh, I think we can move on to the, you know, the GNM part or the, the part of the Haston GNMs. And so the idea here is that um, first I'll explain like what the input is to the model. So the input like XI here are the, you know, in V and VI are the features of the fringe nodes. So these are, you know, could be coordinates or depending on what kind of graph you're working with. And then XJ are uniformly sampled from the neighborhood of the fringe nodes and there we get some kind of um like information about the neighborhood of fringe nodes and also kind of the edges that are connected to the uh, the fringe nodes through their neighbors so here xi are the fringe nodes xj are their sampled neighborhoods and then eij are the edges between the fringe node and the neighborhood node and xg are the features of the goal node and ZT is kind of the state representation or the state at time step T during uh, optimization. So if that's clear, then that's perfect. The, the reason why we have to do this, why we have to have a state is actually because, and this is not something I touched on too much, it's because we are really working in like a partially observable Markov decision process kind of style. Because what's happening when you are doing this kind of learning and, and this kind of, you know, trying to learn the, the, the search heuristic as you can imagine, when, like maybe when you're, if you're familiar with like computer reinforcement learning is that you have some kind of state, you roughly know like what kind of graph you're working with. And then as you are getting the nodes or the observations of the fringe nodes about the rest of the graph, you're kind of understanding like how this graph really looks like. And you're understanding you're kind of reducing your, your um, probability around like what this graph could be. And so that's why you need a representation of the state. You have to somehow keep track of that. And this is like one way to solve the, the problem of like learning when your the problem is a partially observable Markov decision process. So, so this is like the motivation of having a state. That's why we, we, we have the sequences and the state from the first step, if that makes sense. So, uh, but okay, so you see what the input is. And so the next, the first thing that we do, and, and this is, the, unfortunately, it's the only place where there's something that a GNN does, and it's extremely trivial, but like what happens is that we embed the, the, the nodes, basically the features of the nodes together with the goal node and like the, the Euclidean and cosine, and their Euclidean cosine distances. We use like a, like a, you know, just a simple move like MLP to embed them in some kind of embedding space. And then we, we like perform a, like a graph convolution over these embeddings to obtain some kind of representation that, that has information also about the goal node, the, the, the current node that we are working with, and their like trivial distances, which helps with like uh, learning faster. And so then um, the next step that we do, and I think this is, this is an interesting one, is that we apply like the GRU module on all of the nodes that we have in the fringe. So in this case, you know, let's say we have three nodes in the fringe and we obtain these kind of GI representations for them. What we obtain is a new state update for all the fringe nodes. And we obtain like a kind of prediction, like a new, new kind of embedding 
for also all the all the all the nodes, which has, has some information about the state or the, the representation that we have so far about the graph. And so then we have we have you know these three state updates that we obtain by applying the GRU, and we need to aggregate them some somehow. And like ideally, you should do this in a permutation invariant manner because like the the order of the nodes that you explore because we're working in graphs should not impact kind of the the the, the state or the, the learning because like in this case the 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 observations that you get should be permutation invariant because we're working on a graph this is this is different from robotics where you really don't want your observations to be permutation invariant but in this case we really want them to be to, to be permutation invariant because we have a graph i mean by robotics i mean if you're doing control and you're trying to you know escape from a tiger and it really matters in in, in which second you see the tiger because uh, if you if you imagine that you saw it you know five days ago then you'll die so this is the idea here that you perform a permutation invariant state update and you obtain a new state that you can carry on with, with optimizing through. And in the final step, you kind of have an ML an MLP and you use it just to predict the distance. And you know, this is all like just a few parameters. Like you wouldn't have something like huge here. Um, so you have a new kind of distance computation, and you h hat here are the, the, the parameters, or sorry, the prediction of the distance that you get. So this this figure illustrates this like. Here we perform the embedding of each node. We we perform the state update together with the update on the on the on the distance or the or the representation using the state, and then we predict the the, the distance of the node. Yes, Hannes. Okay, yeah. So the, the the h hat this is just the scalar. Yes. Okay, so, and that's our final prediction for the distance that we then use to make our choice. That's correct. Exactly. Cool. And then um, we also have the, the question about homophily. Like, do we do we have anything about the a necessity of the features of the graph being homoph? Um, yeah, about the nodes having to be or the, the graph having to be homophilous. But I guess not. But can you elaborate on that a little? This is only if you explain what homophily is. Okay, uh, homophily is if the uh, if neighboring nodes have similar features. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, so 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 this is an extremely good question. I think what what we I, I I don't think that we saw like problems when they were similar, but I think that you need the features. Uh, or, like you, you cannot have features that are the same and are related to different nodes, and this is a different problem. Like, can we maybe? have an example of what a feature could be in your in your labyrinth uh, what is the feature oh yeah so that that would be just a coordinate of the of the node in the in like a xy plane yeah okay so we kind of have some uh, homophily if you want to see it like that but um yeah, I mean, in, in the maze problem, we don't really need that, right? We just need to know, yeah, we want to go upwards and to, mm -hmm. the, to the right to, be, to have some sort of heuristic. And then the, uh, the network can find the best heuristic or its heuristic. Mm -hmm. So I would say no to that, to that question. Okay, cool. But, um, well, so if you... Mm -hmm. Yeah, in that case, we don't need it. And but I think so. I don't think you know if, if you if you have some like at least to my in my mind, if you have some like aggregation that you know su like sufficiently makes a difference between those two neighboring nodes, then it will be fine. Like I think what what can be a problem if if like after aggregation they are the same. So but if if they are different, then. Uh, I mean, the, it, it could be the case that you also want them to have like a similar heuristic value. So I don't think we have cases here where you have similar features that are like the nodes are, let's say, also close to each other, have similar features, usually means that they also have similar heuristic values. So I don't, I don't think you will run into big problems with that. Okay, then let's go with Jana Meya. Yes, yes, yes Mihal. I just had one question. You, you say that after rollout, you aggregate the trajectory. What right. exactly do you mean by aggregation? Like what sort of aggregation? 
Yeah, so, so the, the, the aggregation is that when you aggregate the first, here, I'll, I'll go back. So here, when you have, what you really have here are just um, sets of nodes and they're ground to distances to the, to okay. the node. And okay. so you store this, like uh, you store these two sequences and you store them like for the full time that you're training. So while you're training, you would train on this particular, you know, sample multiple times. <laughs> Does it make sense? Yeah, and the final aggregation, like how do you do it? Like, is it like an average or how do how can you visualize okay, so, that? So that is, sorry, that's a different aggregation. That 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 means append. That's an append. You append okay, okay. your okay. your your sets of fringe nodes and distances to the data set that you're that you're using. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, sorry. Okay, cool. So this was more or less the approach. Like if you have any questions about the approach or what was in the paper, then of course we can discuss. Sorry, Hannes, is you, are you asking? Okay, cool. Well, yeah, uh, the, the reason I ask is uh, like if you're doing terrain and navigation, right? On the source to, the, to your goal, to, from starting point to goal, the terrain could be different. And if you're using the ter terrain parameters as a feature in the nodes, let's say from a hilly to the seaside, so you will it will sort of have some kind of a homophilic uh, graph because your neighbor will have very similar uh, features if you including the terrain as a feature, right? So I wasn't sure if you're what kind of features you're using or if you are looking into more that kind of uh, applications. But uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, Han makes it very clear like uh, it, it's not really restricted to uh, homophilic. You could like you, in your um, example of the routes of going through different blocks and that's obviously is, it doesn't really matter. Thanks. Yeah, sorry, thanks. I think I was also bottleneck by not knowing what homophilic is. So, but I also, you know, you learn something. So uh, cool. Um, all right, cool. So, so I think we can move on to the experiments. Um, if, if you don't have more questions here, um, the experiments are uh, quite simple. But uh, the idea is that we took some some kind of graphs or some some sets data sets of graphs that are actually from the sale paper, which was you know the state of the art, and they did a similar thing. The main difference between sale and our method is that we had a like a different architecture. We thought about what the architecture should be, and then we also had a state representation that you know helps with this kind of like partially observable problem. And so uh, you can see here a few baselines. Uh, we have a few classical baselines, a few learning-based baselines. So sale is the state of the art, and you have su supervised learning. Uh, then you have we had some genetic algorithm to to kind of optimize for the best uh, policy. And then we also tried like deep Q learning. Um, and so these data sets, you can see uh, for each data set, you can see like three examples of sets of graphs that, or sorry, or three examples of graphs that were in this data set. So you can see that they are, they are not exactly the same, but they have a similar structure. So for example, in the most naive case you have here, like, you know, single wall that has, you know, uh, like one hole and this hole is alternating. So what you really should learn there is that you should go to the wall and go up or something along those lines. So that's, that's the idea. Um, and so you can see that uh, the, the, so the metric that we use is the, the number of visited nodes during training with respect to sale. So sale is, is the method that, so that's why sale is ones everywhere because sale is, we, we normalize by sale. Um, and so you can see that our method performs quite a bit better. I think it was like a 40.8% reduction compared with kind of the, when we were comparing the number of explored nodes. And what was also interesting is that like uh, it was also faster like in this case, it was like seven times faster. Uh, at least, it, I mean, Phil was seven times faster, and it was it used like five times less data to train the heuristic function. And so, the reason why it was faster is is actually because we because we had the state representation. We like what sale did is that they were doing some kind of also uh, search in the graph while they were computing the features because they needed to somehow account for partial observability. And they did this by aggregating information about the past graph. And the reason why it needed less data is because we had this kind of nice permutation invariance. 
uh, embedded at least locally in, in the new fringe nodes. So that was, at least that's why we think it, it was, it, I mean, it trained on 5 MLS data and we had some migration studies, but this is more or less the idea. Um, is this kind of the main experiment where we compare it to sale and then the next experiments are more, more so like showing the versatility of the method and like uh, showing an application as well. So in the next experiment, what we had is that we, oh, sorry, this is the first an example. So you can see that, you know, what, what, what Phil does, Phil is our method, is that like it doesn't really do many redundant expansions. So you wouldn't see Phil doing something like really <laughs> like aggressively uh, like shaking around, for example, as you see sale here, which are basically redundant expansions, which are not necessarily useful of, based on the structure of the graphs that you use to learn the heuristics, if that makes sense. Um, so and this is what we saw in pretty much all the all the all the experiments. Um, yeah. So so if that's fine, then we can move on. Basically, the next experiment that we looked at is like if we look at graphs that come from different areas, can we learn some kind of interesting heuristics that can be maybe even used in practice? So. And, but we, but that's, we definitely want to like try like what happens if you apply our method, let's say to a citation network, like will it, will it learn something useful that, that can be you know, used for search, for example. And so what we found is that, you know, the answer is yes, we were able to beat, let's say the greedy like uh, search method, which is like here H, it means that you're using like the, yeah, so, sorry, Hans, go ahead. Uh, first of all, if we're talking about these graphs, how do you choose your start and end node? Yeah, so so uh, if you don't have that, you, we were just like sampling them randomly. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, so so that that was one thing, and the I think the other thing is that um, you know sometimes you only have a single graph in the data set, but you know we made sure that we during training we saw much less uh, kind of data than the whole kind of graph contains. So we did some calculation that like, even if we use a single graph, like even in the smallest graph, I think it was Quora, we saw like, I, if I remember correctly, it's like up to 10% of the examples in Quora. So there was some generalization um, when we were doing testing. Uh, so yeah, so, so the idea is that even in these graphs, like Phil was able to exploit something and like reduce the number of explored nodes during search. And so the two cases where it was not able to was in OGBG Code 2 and OGBG Mohive, which, which are like, uh, maybe you're familiar with pretty recent data sets. And I, I think in these data sets, it was like, they explicitly made sure that the test set and the train set contained structurally different graphs. And these were the only two data sets where this was the case. And you can see that these are the only two cases where Phil like didn't work so well. So, the, I mean, that just goes to show that, you know, if you want to use something like this, like something like our method, you really need to make sure that you know ahead of time what kind of problems you'll run into at test time, because otherwise, like, it, it's, it's tough to apply in terms of structure. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I think I have an example of Phil in Modena. Sorry, I, I think I... Oh, yeah, sorry, no, one more. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Hannes, go ahead. For that, I would maybe also just say that the uh, okay, no, this doesn't hold for for code, but for for mole HIV, right? If we just have some molecules and you choose two random nodes, there's not really a lot of stuff you can yeah uh, you can do wrong. Is there <laughs> if when searching your optimal path? Well, it seems, well, so what do you mean by wrong? So like misstep or something along those lines? Yeah, like it's almost like a line graph in most cases. Right, so, and if you just choose a random start and a random end, then you, it doesn't matter what direction you go in the line graph. And it basically only uh, is valuable to know which is the, the longer end. And you should go into the direction of the longer end first, I think. Yeah, so, I think yeah, you're you're probably right. I think that it's I, th I found it interesting that it didn't work better than the than the greedy uh, heuristic here. Yeah, and for but the same is for the case for abstract syntax trees, right? There you just have this uh, directed 
yeah, a directed acyclic graph. And how can we have a good search heuristic in that? You have to know kind of if you're in somewhere like, okay. I, yeah, I think if you sample randomly, then that you kind of have to know what's the shortest execution path that, that takes you there. But maybe in those cases, it would be interesting to sample something like the leaves. Mm -hmm. Because there you could ask like, what's the fastest way to exit? I mean, not the fastest, it's just least calls. Like what's the least calls way to exit the exit code? But I don't, I'm not sure if that's useful. Yeah. Okay, but I think maybe these are just um, not the fairest comparison, so to say. Yeah, probably. I, and I also don't necessarily think that there's a straightforward kind of um, idea of how to use this in practice in these applications, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. But then I interrupted you. Yeah, yeah, no, no worries. So I think what, what's super interesting though, is that it was like, you know, these percentages are always misleading, but you can see that it's like quite a bit better than supervised learning. And especially if you look at New York, like in New York supervised learning was, you know, 40 times worse than 3D best first search and ours was better. So I think that that just goes to show that you cannot just forget about kind of the non id nature of the problem. You have to take that into the account. So, yeah, so I think that this was more or less the, the result in this case. And this is just like an illustration in Modena, Italy, of how like a path that Phil, found, Phil finds would look like. And so the green nodes here are the path. And you can see like just for illustration that A star, you know, explores a lot before it gets to the goal. It guarantees you that you have the, you know, the, the, the optimal solution once you find the goal. But on the other hand, like Phil finds one much faster. So yeah, uh, this is the example. And I think the last experiment that I personally enjoyed very much is this kind of drone experiment where we discretized a room um, into a graph. And then I, I trained Phil on a kind of slightly randomized permutations of this room. And then I used the, the heuristic to, to search for basically paths in this room. And what to learn, I mean, so what was constant in, during training is the table in the, in the middle. I was like putting random boxes everywhere, something like a clutter. I was adding like noise to the training. And so the idea is that it learned more or less that, hey, like you should follow along the line, like along, along the table when you're searching toward the goal, et cetera. So you can, let's say, use it quickly in, in these kinds of applications. And I think what's very interesting or what's like a very interesting future application is that to have something that helps you plan then online. Where I'm not sure if some like a lot of you are familiar, but let's say where, when you're doing SLAM in this kind of uh, scenario and you're kind of mapping your environment and building some kind of graph, then it would be nice if you, before like knowing the whole environment, you could already know the distances of a node to expand like towards the goal basically without knowing the rest of the environment because you knew like, you know, in your training set, you had you have environments that have a particular structure. But yeah, so this was what we did in, in, um, in, yeah, in, in the case of, of this kind of drone planning. Um, and you can see that, yeah, again, Phil was, was super, like it performed really well. And what's nice, it, it was also like within 4.9% of the Oracle of the like the really the shortest path. So in this case, like the shortest path is uh, we, we always here we normalized by greedy best first search but we're using the Euclidean like heuristic function and you can see that basically it's it's better than that and it's like very close to to shortest path and uh yeah I think I had one this I think this this was room simple I think there's also like a room adversarial setup where I have more stuff if I remember correctly but yeah you can see that it kind of nicely finds the paths and uh, actually like a funny thing is that I tried to make this visualization with A star, let's say, to compare the two. And I mean, of course, the greedy heuristic works too in this case, but I tried with A star and like the, like my simulator crashed because it was putting too many boxes into the into the environment. So you can see that like it's really important to to add some heuristics because like in practice I couldn't do it. Um, it's not just like a cool story. Um, so yeah, so I think these are the experiments. I think um, yeah, just key insights. 
well, you saw what we did. We did some imitation learning algorithm for trying to imitate an optimal algorithm or optimal heuristic. And then we kind of designed this kind of um, architecture that, that, that you can use to do that. And it had some permutation variants. It had uh, some kind of GNN component to embed the nodes. And yeah, we, we, we showed that it like, outperforms like recently, recently proposed methods for similar uh, problems. And I think that like, I, I really enjoy when people like bring up some future work ideas because um, you know, it gives you maybe opportunities to work on stuff. So I think that um, something that I found like particularly interesting is that like usually what, what happens is that um, you know, when you're doing this kind of search, you're, you're obtaining new fringe nodes or like classically and you evaluate, let's say you, their heuristic distance to the goal node. But you know, in, in this case, what, what, what we do is that when we obtain new information about the graph, it would be awesome if we could look at all the, all the nodes that we have currently in the fringe and then somehow decide like which node is the best one to reevaluate re based on the information that we obtained so far. Like I think that's a pretty exciting research direction because you know the difference between what we do here and the difference between a heuristic search like a classical one is that here like our you know since our state changes we can also make we can also kind of update the the values of the past kind of uh, heuristic predictions and usually you couldn't do this because like that you know your heuristic function like does not depend on this like on this on the on the state basically so I think this is a very interesting research direction. And then like the next one is like, how do you get within, let's say, epsilon of like an optimal solution? Like, because here we completely focused on uh, planning such that or search such that you visit, you know, as, li as little as possible, but you know, what's the best way to trade this off with, um, let's say, uh, you know, finding actually a solution which works extremely well, but maybe exploring a little bit more. And then the last nice one, I mean, the last one that maybe is the most interesting to you. And, and to be honest, I, I'm like, I, I, I know that there is some work on this, like to regularization and, you know, some methods, but I think it like the, the research on like permutation invariant state is also pretty cool. So I think that it would be nice if we would have some truly permutation invariant kind of state representations that you can update with new nodes. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are some, of course, some recent works and, and maybe if some of you will say that, hey, this is done, and you should just like cite this paper and, and use that. But I think that this will be very useful because very often we want to do some kind of reinforcement learning or imputation learning on a graph and having some state that is permutation invariant would be amazing. So uh, yes, I think this was the future work. I think this is it uh, for, for the presentation. Yeah, of course, reach out to me. This is my email if you have any questions or you know, if you, if you have any comments, leave feedback. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. And you can, of course, also reach him on the Slack, but I guess the, the email works just as well. And yeah, if you go back to, to your future work slide, yeah. um, like the, with the optimality, you mean that it would be nice to additionally introduce some, um, yeah, some maybe, have some policy or some heuristic that is worse on average, but gives us some um, guarantees on how close we are to the optimal solution. Yeah, so there is this theory that basically your heuris if your heuristic is admissible, then your an, an admissible has a few, few properties. One of them is that it has to be always less than the optimal cost or the optimal distance then the, the solutions that you find in the end, if you use A star, will be optimal. And so I think there, you know, it would be nice if we could look at you know, how can you, let's say, um, penalize over like, uh, being, like you're predicting like, distances that are too large. Yeah. And, you know, and, and moving to, towards that direction. I think that that's still, um, and, and then use it within something like A star. But uh, to be honest, I haven't tried it. And, but I think it would be nice to explore. Yeah. But then thank you for all of the awesome explanations and the nice answers to our many questions. But I have some a new idea or new plan, so to say, uh, to have these type, types of roles for people um, yeah, that read the paper. And with that, we kind of have a devil's advocate who's, who's me and who is supposed to uh, to find bad points in your paper or to 
who's supposed to fight against um, yeah. the the angel, so to say, and the angel is Jana Meja, yeah. Yes, yes, <laughs> and yes. he should bring up some good points, and we would like to hear, or like he brings up some strong points of the paper, and we would like to hear your opinions on on the stuff. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Michal. Spectacular presentation. Uh, before we got into that, I had just one question in your equation one in the paper. Could you just uh, break it down a bit? Uh, the loss function in equation one. Yeah, so um, that would be really helpful. Yeah. I'm scrolling to equation one. Okay, so. So this, this is really not necessarily what we're exactly doing. This is just to set the scene. So uh, basically in my, you can see my thesis there. It's very specifically written the optimization that we are doing here, since like it's a super short format, this is kind of the high level idea. So what you have here is that, so we sample four things. We sample a graph, we sample a search problem, which is given by two nodes in this graph. And then we sample a time step T for the roll in, right? Okay. And then we sample uh, some kind of state and history which is basically from the state history distribution that I provide here. And you can see that the state history distribution is conditioned on a bunch of things. It's conditioned on the graph, on the time, on the policy that you're using, on the nodes, you know, on the, on the nodes of the graph. And like, yeah, this like one person reviewed my paper and they were asking like, how do you define this state distribution? And you can mm -hmm. write it down. It is a fairly ugly, it is, you know, it's like, it's, it's a big line of math that, that basically just doesn't fit into like this paper. But the idea is that you can sample, I mean, you, you sample this distribution by executing your, your, your algorithm for T steps, right? And so then what we have inside this expectation, so we are averaging over all of these things. So this, this, this is the expectation part. And so what we have here is that kind of the V new set is the set that is kind of the, the set of new fringe nodes, right? So that's, that's V new. And so in this expectation, we are taking the average over the loss over the venue nodes that are, I mean, I mean, and the loss is really just kind of the, the I mean, the, yeah, there is, there is a difference between the squared difference between like the optimal value of the heuristic and what your algorithm predicts. And your algorithm is here that's like conditioned on the history and on the goal node and the node that you're currently considering, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. That was incredibly helpful. Yes. Yeah. Coming back to our previous task, uh, in your um, limitations, you mentioned that uh, if uh, nodes or edges have the same features, then fill doesn't work. But let's say if you have a social network and uh, let's say people have similar gender or age, those would constitute as features, right? Different features. Each node might have different features. So in that case, fill wouldn't work. No, sir. So, so I think what I meant, and I mean what I what I wrote in the paper is that, it, and it's not even that it doesn't work; it's just problematic. If you have nodes that that have the same features that mm -hmm. are not necessarily the same node, then you you might run into issues, right? Because when you're doing your embedding, you run into the problem that like your two of your embeddings might be the same, even though that they are not in the same place in the graph. So this is partially um, solved by actually doing some kind of state-based search. So you, you kind of update the state as you search. And that's why when you, let's say, encounter like the node that you has the same features that you saw before, like it's not, not necessarily as big of a problem as you would have that, like, you know, if you would do just supervised learning. Um, but yeah, like it is, it is like something to consider. But so if, if in case you're, you run into that case or like into that problem, you can always, let's say, perform like a convolution from a larger neighborhood for fill, hmm. if that makes sense. Because then what you're doing is you're adding more information around a node and you're kind of <laughs> embedding the node in the kind of from like a more diverse perspective from like a larger neighborhood, but you're, but you know, it just takes time. So that's, that's the trade off here. But with this situation, you mean uh, this, if two fringe nodes have the same features, right? Not two, two fringe, nodes in general. Yes, if two nodes have two fringe nodes have the same features, and their neighbors have the same features, then then you, but and and the distance is like different, then you have an issue. But it's 
it's I feel like it's it's just like a hard example to kind of um, to kind of come by in real life. But, but yeah. maybe it's I I don't really see that issue, but yeah. Yeah. And what about uh, basic uh, time series forecasting, Michal? Uh, have you considered using it for simple forecasting kind of applications? So in which form? In time series, uh, let's say you want to, let's say you want to do some sort of survival analysis on a stock and you want to see when a stock would lose value over time. Is this kind of fill, would it be useful in those scenarios? Um, how would you, oh, but Mike, Micha first. Um, oh yeah, so, so there, I mean, so fill has components that are useful in that case. So, but you know, it's not a contribution of fill, if yeah. you see my point. So. Like Phil, of course, uses something you know, like a recurrent kind of neural network, which is extremely important for for time series, but it is not what Phil is kind of made for. It is also not the contribution of Phil. So um, if you can cast time series forecasting as a heuristic search in a graph, then then maybe. But I I'm not so familiar with that. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Go ahead, Hans. Okay, well then, thanks for your points. Um, and yeah, I wanted, like for example, the you use these distances, the cosine and the Euclid, Euclidean distance between the embeddings or yeah, between the embeddings. And have you done any ab ablations with that? Like using no distance at all? Yeah, so I did a bunch of ablations, but not on that. So that I, I, the no distance at all, I did it. That's of course the, in, you know, the first thing that I tried, like I didn't have any distance there, but, and, and basically then I was playing around with this and then I tried to add them and I saw like, wow, it, it you know, learns faster or whatever, but I never actually ran the experiment. Okay. Yeah, but, we, but I see, I see why that needs an ablation. So I think that's a great point. I like, yeah. Mm, but yeah, like the why would we need the, the distances if we have the function that has access to the or like the MLP that has access to the embeddings itself already? And uh, but maybe it kind of makes it easier to learn because in many cases the Euclidean distance is actually helpful. And, yeah, but I, I just think it would be nice to. Um, yeah, if it would be possible to get some insights on on the distances, and I don't know what kind of crazy distance measure, measures there are. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, I agree. I think that um, at least like when I tried a few times, like in this case as well, but in many other cases, this is more more general point where when I, you know even if you're let's say my architecture had a enough expressive power to compute something sometimes it was useful to just provide it if you if it helps if that makes sense so it, it, it like so that, that that's like an observation that's maybe maybe it's useful. kind of like making the information more explicit or if yeah. we already know that the euclidean distance should be somewhat helpful and we're kind of pointing it out that yeah, yeah. What it is. but this is of course all very intuitively speaking and uh, we don't really actually have any idea what's what's going on um but then permutation invariant embedding yeah can you explain that a little bit again like the the whole memory thing yeah sure so it's okay if i i'm i move my slides right um yeah yes yes so, so what happens here is that we use the GRU. So, so these are the embeddings of the nodes with the target. Okay, so here you don't have um, any information about the state. You, you, you here like the G's here are you know just these embeddings here, right? So we we just use the graph convolution to embed them. And so then what happens is that you apply the GRU module to each like one of these nodes, right? So you apply it to G1, you apply it to G2, you apply it to G3. And what you obtain then is like three states and each states like 
like I mean, but by each states, I mean these kind of Z eyes. Um, each each of these contain like the information about the past state and also information about the new new node that you added to the state. If you see my point. Um, yeah, but it's kind of missing the information of the um, the nodes that were currently fringe. Yes, so that's that's true, and that's the trade off here. So that's that's I'm not sure if I write it in the paper or just in the thesis or uh, you know the trade off here is that like you 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 do this in parallel it's fast so that that's the first benefit the second benefit is in like permutation invariant but the downside is that you don't have information about the current fringe node but then you know again if you wanted to add that you have to decide like in which order you want to do it but of course if you just do it in any order. Like you would have more information to predict uh, the node based the kind of the next node distance. If that makes sense. And if there was some way to kind of do it in all orders or something like that, that might be nice. Yeah, that, that would be interesting. So you do it in all orders, and then you have like you know a lot of states, and so then you want to do something with the, with the state. Some attention and or some pooling, and then you end up with your final representation. Yeah. OK. Michal, yeah. uh, do you always assume that the number of nodes are the same throughout, or can they change over time? So wait, what number of which nodes? Um, the number of nodes within the graph, can they change over time, or are you assuming that they do not change? over time when you're trying to find the uh, so here they don't change over time okay thank you like uh, but just to be sure we can have graphs with different numbers of nodes of course yeah but once you have a graph the graph doesn't grow yeah. okay then maybe a I think to one more question to i think yeah i just had one quick one which is uh the way I saw you compared performance was uh, you checked the number of explored nodes. Is that right? When you compared it with others, uh, would it be possible? So uh, the way I see it is uh, exploring a node is 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 your algorithm. You do some uh, computations with the heuristics of it. Can also be measured in terms of performance. So maybe it could have been possible to measure the timing it takes to 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 compute the uh, uh, to compute the path from start to end instead of having a matrix as to number of explored nodes. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So that is a that is a really great point. We have one. We we did have some time comparison, like it's not super extensive. That the point. I mean, it's very intricate and it's hard to get. I mean, in, and maybe there are some counter examples. But the idea was that, like, compared to the state of the art on a, on the data set that we were looking at, we had a reduction in time that was above the reduction in just the number of explored nodes. That means that it was not only it didn't only like gain time from the fact that like it explored less because if you would have the constant like speed in the in the algorithm then that you know that's the only like if, if the two would be like equivalent but just one of them would explore um somehow less then then that's basically the only component that we would have but we had an extra component which was because our architecture ran faster like in that specific case but yes of course like your point is super valid it's just always really hard to to do that when you have um when when some some of the baselines you don't necessarily implement but you just use from other paper and of course you know it's time etc but yes this is kind of on my on my to do list right now to have, to have a comparison with it. it it makes sense so not only were you able to i mean not only did you benefit from reduction in the number of nodes explored but also the time to explore each node is most likely faster in in your case as compared to others yeah Understood. Got it. Thank you so much. Yeah, Michal, I just had a quick question in your algorithm. Uh, so when you try to find the state ST, what does the superscript uh, mean? Uh, you have seen fringe and unseen. I think uh, in your paper. Oh, in the paper. Uh, okay. Yeah, in the paper, page um, eight, algorithm two. 
Page eight, Agam two. Okay, okay. So we're going into many. Yeah, yeah. Here, uh, roll in time. Uh, yeah. Roll in time when you're trying to find state st. What does the uh, superscript signify? Here and and the v's. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of the 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 I I believe yeah it's it's the step of the v. So this is the zeroth state. Okay. And so the next one is, is v1. Oh, sorry, go back. Let's scroll. Next one is v1, and then you have, and then you're incrementing it as as you go on. Okay, okay. And you also uh, update the fringe nodes as well, correct? Apart from the steps. Yeah. yeah. So so that I mean the whole state is being updated as you go along. So you have new fringe nodes, new, new seen nodes, new new unseen nodes. Okay. Spectacular, Mehul. Thank you for the details. Yeah, then I also want to say thank you for the all the answers to our questions, but also to the rest of the audience. Thank you for your questions. And yeah, great, great talk and great discussion. And not to forget, it's just an awesome paper. Like I really I'm grateful to whoever suggested this one. I don't remember the name right now, but it's just such a neat focused problem you can yeah you just know and i've never seen it considered before with a learned with something learned and yeah i didn't even know that people were were doing this but i think in the end it's just a cool a cool a cool problem but i think in the end this is also kind of pretty impactful you no know? like what's your judgment on that like you you now have a much better heuristic in some cases yeah i think that sorry you're asking or no 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 mihal very cool idea go ahead ah okay yeah so so um yeah i think that it could be useful that that's that, i think that uh, <laughs> you know it's always like this the the only issue is that it's it's not always easy to have a data set of okay. that you know that you will search over but if in case you have that then it's super easy to apply and hopefully people will so yeah okay cool yeah. but i guess that's a, a good point to end it unless you you have some last words for us no thanks for inviting me it was a lot of fun i i really enjoyed it and you brought up some great points i learned also something so yeah it was awesome Awesome. Yeah, we definitely or I definitely learned a lot and I hope every, everyone else too. But then um, I think you all enjoyed Christmas, I hope. Or when if Christmas is still going on for some people, then Merry Christmas. But in any case, uh, Happy New Year to, to everyone. And see you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Enjoy the new year and see you next week. Yeah, definitely a super neat problem. And although Michal is staying humble and saying, yeah, maybe this thing is useful, I think it sounds pretty impactful. And um, if you have the, the right training data or you know what type of problem you need a heuristic for, then this is, it seems like a very, very strong method that can give you a, a big improvement in performance compared to, to other search heuristics. And of course, you don't need your domain uh, expertise anymore. And with that, I want to say a last thanks to Michal and you can find all the um, social medias that we have, all of the uh, mailing lists or the, the Slack channel where you can get weekly updates down in the description. <laughs>